Hello and welcome to the Brave New Weed podcast. And now here's your host, Joe Dolce. Welcome to a new episode of the Brave New Weed podcast. Hello, Matthew. Hi, Joe. Good to be back. How you doing this week? I've it's been a topsy turvy week, I have to say. We have a lot of crazy news in the world. I think we have Republicans pushing the hemp bill through. We have um, uh, Oklahoma passing one of the most liberal medical cannabis laws in the country. I want to talk about this news because it's the world seems even more upside down, even even yeah. regarding cannabis. Yeah, here. let's dive in a little bit deeper. Let's talk about let's talk about hemp first, okay? Well, uh, the big news, uh, of course, what you're referring to is the Senate uh, has officially voted and passed its farm bill, its version of the farm bill, which needs to be reconciled by the House. Right. There's a little bit of uh, the House passed their own version, and uh, so the important part for us, what we were talking about, is that the Senate version absolutely includes a provision to legalize the cultivation and production of industrial hemp in all of the United States. Which means they can actually produce CBD, correct? That's right. And the weirdest thing, which made me think this is a topsy-turvy <laughs> world, is that Mitch McConnell... Yurtle the Turtle. Yurtle the Turtle sponsored this. I mean... Yeah. It, no? No, it, it's it, 23 Listen, if I was in a state members, with a lot of farmers who had nothing to do but grow cotton and other horrible things, I would say, yeah, grow some hemp. It's, e it's easy. It's good. It cleans the soil. Yeah, this came up when he, uh, when he was the sponsor of the bill. We discussed it a few episodes back. It is pretty shocking but i think he nailed it it's just hey i need to serve my constituents you know we're we're struggling on the farmer s aspect of of all things why not let's get into growing some hemp. something useful something and it, really useful and it also d doesn't this just lay groundwork and infrastructure for the oncoming legalization. cultivation legalization of, of actual all cannabis it's time. It's definitely time. So you were right, though. Uh, the version of the bill that passed the House of Representatives did not include any provision in this regard. So, But because both bills were passed, it will now go into reconciliation, yeah. which is a bipartisan committee uh, that will put this through. There are very strong opponents uh, to this inclusion in the farm bill. However, none of them are representative in the group that will go through the reconciliation process. So it is very, very likely that this will be included in the bill that will hit Donald Trump's desk. And he's already indicated that he will sign it. To grow a plant that is not psychoactive, not in any way deleterious to humankind. Okay, great. Yeah, okay. It should be a chip shot, right? Goodbye to that level of prohibition. <laughs> what about Oklahoma? <laughs> now, that was weird, I have to say. So the Oklahoma story is pretty wild. Oklahoma has passed uh, what by all objective standards, seems to be the most liberal medical marijuana bill to date in the United States. People can carry, what, three, three ounces of flour? Let me just them? tell you. So a couple of the uh, caveats that are carved out and rules that are carved out in this bill, uh, any one person with a prescription uh, can possess up to three ounces of marijuana on their person uh, up to six mature marijuana plants, up to six seedling plants, so that's 12 total, 12. <laughs> possess up to one ounce of concentrated marijuana one in ounce. any mm -hmm. form, up to 72 <laughs> ounces of edible marijuana, and up to eight ounces of marijuana in their residence total. Okay. Oklahoma. It, I don't know that I've ever had eight ounces of marijuana on my in my possession at any time. I guess the Oklahomans, who knows why this is happening? Who understands these things? But listen, I don't, if you're a patient and you need that amount of, of substance on you, you, I guess you can carry it very easily in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And I guess if you need more, uh, more than that, and I don't know what you would be doing that you need more than that. Uh, but if you do violate it, it, it constitutes a misdemeanor violation. Uh, and the fine associated with that misdemeanor shall not exceed $400. There is sanity in Oklahoma, <laughs> in the state of Oklahoma. Which, uh, well, I, I don't want to offend any of our Oklahoma viewers, but as an original Kansan, it comes as a big surprise, surprise. that there's sanity anywhere in that surprise, state. Surprise, indeed. Sorry, Oklahoma. Okay, let's talk about this other crazy headline, which is just makes, makes my blood boil. What was the headline you read the other day in the, call, in the Denver Post? <laughs> All right, so the, the, the tale is old as time. The Denver Post published an article 
that, that is titled, Marijuana Addiction is Real and Rising. An estimated 9% of marijuana users become addicted. So I just have to say that in 2003, there was an article that basically said, you know, addiction's this, this glitch of the brain, in fact. And it posted numbers. It said 32% of people who use tobacco become dependent, mm. 23 who used heroin do, 17% who try cocaine, 15% who try alcohol, and 9% who try marijuana. So, A, the headline is a joke because, A, this is not news, and B, the level of addiction is quite a different, it's a, it's a big topic. Addictionologists are very torn about this, mm -hmm. you know. What does addiction mean and what kind of physical dependence does it create? There's no doubt that there is a group of people who use way too much cannabis and mm. they get fuzzy and foggy and, you know, the sentence goes on for 30, 30 minutes, sure. right? We know these people. There's no doubt that there's some weird cognitive stuff that goes on. But to report this as news and then to also report, oh, what they're saying is that because the potency of the plant has become stronger, right. the rate of addiction has gone higher, is such bad journalism and such sort of weird prohibitionist hysteria that it really surprises me that a newspaper like the Denver Post would go there. But well, and it's patently untrue. And the, the article does dive into, you know, some of the opponents of the study who, uh, you know, yep. speak a little bit yeah. further into it. And the idea that the stronger the, the potency, the more addictive the substance actually gets dispelled in this argument because it, it doesn't actually matter how much or little you smoke, how strong or weak it is. It's 9% if it's 9%. Yeah. And, and it also talks about the differences between physical addiction and mental addiction, which is more an addition to the ex an addiction to the experience uh, and the effects than it is to the actual substance. Yeah, it's a complicated. Um, but to, to double down on your point A of this rising number, uh, actually the first related article linked in this post is another post also published by the Denver Post, dated 2014, which says, marijuana addiction on the rise, 9% of users at risk. They keep reporting the same thing or the same thing. Anyway, it's been a busy week in the world of marijuana. One other thing, Joe, before we dive away, What's uh, that? going back to the big governmental news, um, we did see the FDA approve the first cannabis derivative drug for use in the form of a Pedialex. Pedialex is for epilepsy, mm -hmm. and it's produced by this company called GW Pharmaceuticals, which is based in the UK. And they also produced something called Sativex, which is a very similar drug. It's a one-to-one -one THC CBD ratio. It's from their plants that they grow. The problem has always been the cost, and I hope to explore this in a future episode. But a couple of years ago, the cost of Sativex was upwards of $800 a month. Mm -hmm which is insane for a one-to-one -one CBD THC ratio, even with special cannabinoids grown into it, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a very sort of, um, let's say, upper tier, out of reach pharmaceutical for most people. Mm -hmm. um, and I, wanna, I really want to talk to some people about this in an upcoming episode about the value of an $800 a month cannabis-derived botanical medicine. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, my brain uh, processes it in a different fashion because the first thing that pops to my mind when I when I read about you know the FDA approving a Pidiolex is, isn't this now a chink in the armor of the Schedule One classification of cannabis? Because now here you are saying that there is, in fact, a health benefit uh, to the point that the FDA has formally approved mm -hmm. its use for epilepsy, doesn't that blow the Schedule One classification That's completely out of the water? It's a really good question, but I think it, it's part of that argument. I think it's definitely part of that argument. So, again, like most things cannabis, this may be a mixed blessing. Yeah, maybe, maybe we need something good and something ridiculous that comes out of that it. That wouldn't surprise me. Maybe we need to reach out to some of our friends on the Hill or some of our friends like Joe Bondi in the legal world and uh, get a little bit more information on whether or not this could be used to challenge the scheduling of cannabis or whether or not this FDA approval has deeper health benefits to um, long-term health care for epilepsy than, than we understand. Let's explore this in a future episode, definitely. 
Don't forget, every episode of the Brave New Weed podcast is available on demand at bravenewweed.com slash podcast. Check out episodes from having a good time with a cannabis cocktail to dealing with crippling pain or anxiety with CBD. All available at bravenewweed.com slash podcast. This week's guest is Derek Gilman, who I met uh, in Ventura, California a few weeks ago. Now, Derek has been a master grower for many years. He's also been part of a culture of North California growers who have just been really growing heritage strains to extraordinary effects. He introduced me to a strain called In the Pines, which was one of the most interesting, involving, engaging strains of cannabis I've ever used. Now Derek has a new show on Greenflower Media, and it's called High Rollers. And he's sort of, this show is about, it interviews some of the other master growers who've kept the the culture of Northern California growing alive, especially during the dark years of Prohibition, but have also been very much out of the spotlight by choice. Um, and now they're, they're really, this is where they're coming out. I mean, this is, they are really setting the stage. They're talking about sun-grown, organic cannabis, grown from heritage, uh, heritage seeds that really makes the product grown in the Emerald Triangle some of the best cannabis in the world. So he's made it his business on this show to interview a dozen or so of these folks. I think it's really worth having a look at and tuning in to some of these characters because they really are some great characters. Hello again. Oh. <laughs> Hi, Joe. How are you doing? So I'm good, Derek. Hey, I've been watching uh, High Rollers, and I really love it. I think it's a great show. It's sort of a mix of, what would you say, like a wine show and a food show and a talk show? How do you describe what it is? I, I describe it as a conversational style talk show that effectively explores the world of cannabis connoisseurship. The tools, the it's techniques. It's almost like you're, um, it's like a national service. I think, pro- I think you're providing a national service, Derek. It's sort of like preserving and bringing to light a lot of the hidden knowledge that some of these, I don't know, growers, makers, users, connoisseurs have had hidden for a very long time. Do you see it that way? Absolutely. Um, you know, my intention in, uh, in creating the series uh, was twofold, was to show cannabis consumers that there's another side that they likely have not seen or been exposed to, that side of connoisseurship, that side of really paying attention to the product you're consuming, not just looking at it and smelling it and saying, oh, that really got me loaded, but paying attention to how that product was made, how was it handled. And when you start looking at those details, you start being able to tell the difference between good quality and bad quality. And my mission through the show um, is to show people how to assess that quality and appreciate it. And I feel that will drive the demand to these small craft farmers that, uh, you know, they've been my friends for so long. Let's come back to that at the very end, because I want to talk about that. But how did you get this job? What are your qualifications? Greenflower uh, hired me on uh, a little more than a year ago. Uh, the CEO of Greenflower, Max Simon, is a friend of mine who I had met uh, through our local uh, co-op in uh, Ojai, California. And uh, we became friends over time. And Max uh, was extremely impressed with the cannabis that, uh, that I had been growing. Uh, which I found quite flattering, considering you know Max, as CEO of this uh, cannabis media company, had been traveling up and down the state uh, for the past uh, three years, effectively sampling some of the finest cannabis available, and uh, he was so thoroughly impressed with uh, with my flowers and my product and my knowledge that uh, he made me a pitch to uh, to become part of the Green Flower team. Well, I must say, that's how I met you. Let's be honest here. I met you through sharing a joint of something called In the Pines, which to me was one of the most memorable strains of cannabis that I've tried in a very long time. Um, And it made me very aware of you very quickly. Um, Tell me a little about, was that the strain that Max was talking about too? 
Yeah, the In the Pines strain comes from um, comes from a, a seed company called Aficionado Estates that has won multiple Emerald Cups, yeah. which is the the premier you know outdoor uh, sun grown organic uh, competition. The best, in, uh, in, it's definitely the best festival in the world, don't you think? For cannabis, uh, weed cannabis, oh, yes. It certainly is, um, and it's and it's just right up my alley because it's it's specific to sun grown organic, uh, which I'm a firm believer of. Uh, but that in the pines came from aficionado who uh, who was placed high many times at the Emerald Cup. The in the pines itself uh, had placed within the top five for for many years. And uh, I grew it out. This was my second year of growing it out, the the sample that you tried. I had uh, two uh, two girls out and back amongst my twelve, and uh, it just creates this wonderfully fruity, intensely flavorful, and aromatic uh, experience. Um, that is just it's it's cerebral, it's clear headed, it's conversational. It 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 cuts through. Um, it just cuts through any fogginess that you may have going on. And it's, it's, it's a very special strain for sure. Have you ever had it tested? Only one. Have you ever uh, had it tested? I have had it tested. Absolutely. I have my cannabis tested every, uh, each year. So what's the, what's the dominant terpene structure in it? What's the, what's the composition there that makes it so, so clear? So yeah, clear. This is the best word I can use to describe it. Translucent almost. It uh, certainly has some of the pining in there. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'll bet. <laughs> right in the pines um but it, yeah it's it's a combination of that of the pinene and the limonene uh i believe which both tend to be more upper type terpenes in the terpene range you know as opposed to say like a linalool or a myrcene which is certainly more uh sedative um so it's a combination of that pinene and the and the, and the limonene in there and uh, and all those other cannabinoids um, and the interaction between them that just uh, has created that special uh, special Beautiful. strain. Is it, is, is it a high THC or just medium? It's uh, it's it's relatively average. It, it it's uh, mine. I've been hitting eighteen percent THC with uh, with my girls on that one. See, and I, I love that. that because it, 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 it takes away this whole mystique that the stronger the cannabis, the better it is. And yeah, no, I mean, just like alcohol, that's not a, that's not a hit across the face. It's, it's a gentle sort of cannabis compared to most, right? Compared to many, I would say. Sure. Um, you know, I mean, uh, you know, alcohol connoisseurs, wine connoisseurs, wine and spirits connoisseurs, they don't go for the strongest. Of course not. Those, you know, the the alcohol connoisseurs aren't drinking the, you know, the 151 and the, and the, uh, the Everclear, (laughs) the most potent. They're going for the flavors. Of course, of course they are, and it makes complete sense. So I'm so glad you did that. So that's really how you began. Then you so, but but um, I mean I know you were telling me something about your grow um, in Ojai where you live. How big are these in the pine trees that you grow? The in the pines, uh, being a, a more sativa leaning strain, you know, hence those those wonderful clear headed effects that we get. Um, those those sativa leaning strains tend to get quite large. Specifically, um, <laughs> the big. in the pines uh, that I have in uh, in three hundred gallon uh, containers uh, get to be anywhere from twelve to fourteen feet tall by about ten feet wide. It's a forest. Of plants, uh, Derek. The largest yield I actually ever got was from an in the pines uh, two seasons ago, and I got uh, a little over nine pounds uh, from just one plant. That is extraordinary. Yeah. <laughs> you are a master grower. You have the touch, certainly. <laughs> that is for sure. That Thanks is for so. sure. So, so I've seen a couple of your shows. I've seen a few episodes of it. I've seen. Uh, Swami from Swami Select, who lives up in Mendocino, I believe. Mm-hmm. And then I saw this character called Frenchy Cannoli, who's a master hashish maker, and he is amazing. And I saw another one uh, with, uh, I'm only remembering his his name before he became famous in the cannabis world, Adam Orenstein, also known <laughs> as, also known as, what's his, what's his cannabis name? Kyle Cushman. Most Kyle people know Cushman. him as Kyle Cushman. I, I know. I'm 
completely backwards. I remember the fact that he's really Adam Orenstein, probably from New York. But it, here's what I want to say. Go on. It's been pretty recently that he's uh, been coming out with his original name. You know, hey, for, for the last couple of decades. He's How about that? Exactly. Legalization makes you come out of your closets, right? He gets to be but, Adam again. <laughs> you know, he gets to be Adam, exactly. Although I think Kyle Cushman's maybe the more romantic version of him than Adam Orenstein. But nonetheless, what it's strikes so me and what has always struck, st- struck me about the world of cannabis is that growers are are a different sort of breed of human being. They love plants. I actually think they're, they're plantophilia. They, they lo- they're so in love with their plants. Now, I want to ask you, as a grower, as a master grower, are you a plantophile? Are you completely in love with your plants? I got to be honest with you, Joe. I'm in love with my cannabis plants. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I have found that there is just um, a unique and special relationship um, that comes from growing cannabis that is unlike growing anything else. Um, and I attribute that in large part to the fact that, you know, we, 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 we raise these things up. I always raise my plants from seed. You know, I start with this tiny little pebble of a stone and over the period of 10 months, take that tiny little thing and take it into this, you know, 12 foot tree, you know, that yields all these pounds. Um, but ultimately I consume this cannabis and become one with it on the most intimate of levels, Joe. This cannabis and the cannabinoids, they're binding in my receptors. Derek, you sound like you are in love with this plant. This sounds like a sexual a sexual this sounds like a sexual relationship here. What do you what do you, what explain this to me, please? Well maybe I guess I am a plantophile then. Huh? <laughs> um you know you could I you think could, you are my friend. You could grow tomatoes, you could consume those tomatoes. And your body processes those tomatoes within a matter of hours. The cannabis is it's it's held in your body, like I said. It mates with those receptors. <laughs> and it's um it's just a very unique experience. And once you've gone through the cycle a few times of growing the plant, consuming it, becoming one with it, you begin to recognize this special relationship throughout the entire growth cycle. Um, and I first noticed this, this feeling, this vibration, this energy, I, I don't know what to call it, Joe, <laughs> um, but I first noticed it when during the off season, after I had harvested, after the girls were gone and it was a month or so later and, and then everything was down and it was between the seasons that I just had this kind of empty feeling that I couldn't quite put my finger on until I began the process again. And immediately that energy came back and I was able to make that association with, with what I was missing, with what with that hole in my heart, I guess. You are definitely a plantophiliac. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you seem like such a normal person otherwise. Yeah. Do I have I that right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess you ask the right questions and then you, you get the... <laughs> but let's talk a little shine. bit about... Uh, well, I mean, I, what I thought was sort of interesting is some of the some of the knowledge I heard from some of your subjects, like Swami, um, that I questioned. And, and I want to talk to you about this for a second. So he said to me, or he said on your show, I should say, the joint is a is a perfect instrument for creating, uh, you know, it, it, it's the perfect smoking vehicle, basically, right? Um, the cannabinoids burn differently as the joint gets lower, and as it does, as the temperature goes up, it is it burns all of the different cannabinoids. So you get the full combustion of the flower, and I think that's a lovely sort of poetic explanation. But then I went to Dr. Ethan Russo, who's pretty much an expert in the field, and he said to me, Joe, look, the joint, it's perfect for creating smoke and lung irritation by burning at too high of a temperature. Vaporizing is a much better alternative to deliver the goods at a more reasonable temperature. So I guess my question to you is, is some of the knowledge, some of the connoisseurship that you're hearing is it myth masquerading as fact? What's your take on this? How do you how do you judge? How do you how do you make those distinctions? I would say that that uh, the Dr. Ethan Russo is is viewing this 
from his perspective, as we all will. And his perspective as a medical doctor is focused on the human body. It's focused on the interactions, right? Um, yep. And certainly uh, smoke is more of an irritant than, uh, than, say, the cooler temperatures you may get from vaporizing the cannabis. All right. However, just because it's less of an irritant doesn't necessarily make it the better delivery method. And so when you start talking about the science of it, Joe, what I will bring up with you and what I would counter to Dr. Russo is the boiling points of the various cannabinoids, of the various terpenes, of the various um uh, flavonoids that are present in the cannabis plant. There are hundreds of these chemical compounds, Joe, and any chemist will tell you that each chemical has a point at which it changes from yep. a solid to a gas. It's Definitely. called volatization, is, is, is the scientific term. Volatization, not even vaporization, it's volatization. Each of these chemical compounds has different points and different temperatures at which they volatize and become available to the person that's that's inhaling them. So for example, if you're using a vaporizer, as we know, most vaporizers are operating within a very narrow temperature range. That's Quite right, about 385, 360 to 385 basically, maybe 360 yeah. to 385, maybe 400. So let's talk about let's talk about THC which has a boiling point of around 315 degrees. So that one's getting fully volatized, provided sure. your, your vaporizer's getting there. Uh, your CBD is a little higher, a little, a little higher. closer to maybe, maybe yeah, 350, 360 degrees. Um, your THCV, okay, is, is, is a cannabinoid. It's one of the exotic cannabinoids that is also a euphoriant as THC is, it does not volatize until 428 degrees. So uh, this is all correct. Absolutely. The science shows that. But burning is 780 degrees. So there's a big variance there. Um, and I'm not, look, I'm not here to argue about what's the perfect ideal sure. way to smoke Actually, anything, by the so, way. Well, so burning, when you say seven, so, so it's like, uh, it's like you know, I believe 780, but I may be off a few. Well, it's like the old book, you know, Fahrenheit 451. So every, so, so burning combustion, well, it depends on what you're combusting now, doesn't it, Joe? Yes, of course, of course. So plant material and cannabis actually begins to combust right around the mid 400s. Okay. The, Yes. That's when the combustion begins. Um, so now let's let let's look at the joint. Okay. The joint is a unique delivery method when it comes to combusting. Unlike a pipe, unlike um, any other way you might combust, the joint has that cherry that's at mm -hmm. the very end that's actually combusting. Well, what about one millimeter to the inside of that cherry that hasn't combusted yet? and you're drawing that hot air through, is it not, is that not vaporizing and volatizing before it's been even combusted? Are you saying as you draw it through, it cools? Is that what you're suggesting? As, I'm saying as you draw it through, and depending on how you smoke, let's so cigar smokers, for example, cigar smokers are very careful in how they light their cigar and how they smoke their cigar. Reason being, they're trying to keep that cigar as cool as possible as they're smoking it because the flavor compounds, they're trying to preserve them until they've smoked it. If you were to, you never see a cigar smoker taking these long, hard draws. No, never, never, you know never. It's, it's these light puffs, puff, puff, puff. And I smoke joints the same way. And by doing this puff, 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 you're preserving these terpenes and these other cannabinoids through the joint as you know to take it to, to, to the other extreme let's say i'm smoking a joint and i take one of these super long hard draws and i'm drawing all that hot air from the cherry through the through the joint you're vaporizing a lot of that flavor and a lot of those cannabinoids in that initial hit and that's a great hit 
the guy who takes that big, huge hit, he's doing great. But the minute he passes it, or the minute if you're smoking that joint yourself and you get to the second half of that joint, it's already been vaped out. You vaped out a good part of that flavor. I'm sure you smoked a joint and you got to the second half and it's like, well, what happened? It's it, it's not as good as it was initially. Oh, yeah. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. In all likelihood, it's how that joint was smoked. <laughs> okay. I'll take, I'll take that as a fine point of kind of connoisseurship um yeah and on and uh, and on high rollers uh, swami uh explains it in in a, in a very eloquent way for sure um and i would uh i'd recommend anybody who hasn't watched yet to go check it out <laughs> no, swami is, is incredibly articulate i mean he once told me that when he is judging the emerald cup which he does i think every year he samples some enormous numbers of strains in a month i think at last count it was 600 something like yeah. that. I, I, and it, it really struck me at the time. It's like, how could you possibly have the state of mind, the presence of mind to be able to judge? Then I started realizing it's really not about the high so much as about many other things. The, 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 maybe the look, the smell when you, when you uh, crunch a bud between your fingers, the, 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 the different cannabinoids. He takes what's called a dry hit on a joint, which is, I think, before it's even lit, correct? What would you say yeah. are some of the... Yeah, I mean, I love that. I think it's just like a great thing. What would you say are so some I'm, of the other ways of of, of judging? Well, it's one of the things that we, uh, we discuss on High Rollers with each of the experts we bring in because each expert has their own methods. You know, you have a Swami who's been judging the Cannabis Cup 14 times now, and his methods have evolved over the years. He even says, you know, while he may have 600 samples to go through in a month, if he gets a sample and he puts it to his nose and it doesn't have any aroma whatsoever, He's he has enough here. experience to know that it's not going to have any flavor whatsoever. And he yep. really doesn't need to waste his time in, in judging that particular sample because it has, you know, no hope of making it to the, you know, the top 20. Yeah. Um, somebody like a, like a Frenchie has his own methods for assessing the quality of hashish. He looks for the melt. He looks for it. He looks. He looks at the consistency of that product, and he can tell a lot, you know, from just how it how it smears in his hand, or perhaps if he takes a a, a flame to the edge of it and just how it bubbles up a little bit, he can assess the quality. Is that, of that what product. he means by the melt? The way it bubbles, the way it actually melts in the bowl or in the pipe. Yes. Yes, and and how completely it melts, how quickly it it wants to melt, and how and how uh, completely. It, it eventually melts He's looking for a full melt correct yeah um, most consumers are looking for a full melt these days however frenchie's technique that he uh, that he explains uh he's unique in the um in the hash and concentrate world in the sense that he combines all of the trichome heads together to make his product, you know, he makes what's known as, a, as a ice water hash. Yeah. Um, many of the ice water hash makers, they use these various bags at various uh, mesh levels to separate the, the trichome sizes. And ultimately, they keep those separated through to the end product. Mm -hmm. um, Frenchie feels that each of those trichome heads and sizes represents a different dimension of ripeness. And the only way to, to, to truly experience a complete uh, experience is to have them all together. Uh, hence, that's how he makes his. However, but not, by is he doing not using different filtering bags, is that is that the he, distinction? Uh, no, he 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 only uses a single bag. But because he does it that way, his product doesn't get to become a truly full melt sort of product. Um, whereas Dank Duchess, who we also had on High Rollers, uh, and she was a a student of Frenchie's, she separates out. Just one of the uh, one of the micron sizes, specifically the seventy four micron, she separates that one out. She combines all the others, and she ends up with a full melt product because she's discovered that it's just the seventy four micron that it's keeping the the balance of the hash from becoming full melt. So she makes two products. She makes her seventy four, and then she makes everything else. Interesting. Do you, do you call her Dank? What, how, how do you, <laughs> you call Duchess? I mean, how do you how do you refer to a woman called Dank Duchess? What's your how do you talk to her? <laughs> her royal dankness. Her royal dankness. 
Really. <laughs> <laughs> I may be the only one who refers to her that way, but uh, that's I, I think that's, that's that is probably the only way that's appropriate. But how, <laughs> I think that's some pretty good characters. I mean, just having a look at Swami, for example, is a great is a great treat. Um, I wonder what his name was before he became Swami, actually. But how do you how do you William. choose the character? What was it? I happen to know. His, what was it? his name was William. And William was a professor, was he not? Do I have that right? William was a William was a cameraman, and he goes. And this is another wonderful story that he that he tells on High Rollers. Uh, William was a cameraman who traveled over to uh, to the Middle East and the Far East to do uh, to do a, a movie project, and was so taken by what he discovered over there. Uh, subsequently returned and, uh, and and dove deep down that rabbit hole, as we both know, <laughs> and ultimately came back swami. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you select the characters that you invite onto the show? Uh, Joe, um, you know, uh, growing, uh, you know, I'm a second generation cultivator um, out here in California. I grew up in this, um, in this environment and I've just been following. There's there's been a handful of people who are um, are my heroes, um, and that is you know people like Swami, um, Leo Stone of Aficionado Seeds, Mean Gene from Mendocino, um, Frenchie Cannoli, obviously uh, Kyle Cushman. Um, these were people that I had just been following on, as, as a as an enthusiast. <laughs> and so when it came time to, uh, to put high rollers together, it was, it was easy for me to, uh, to know who to, to make those phone calls to. What's your goal in doing the show? If you were to say, okay, I have, I have three goals by doing this other than, sort of bringing the knowledge to the wider realm. Is there any, are there any other hopes and dreams you have from doing this? Other than having a really good time and smoking great cannabis with my heroes. <laughs> I need more of a reason that. Enough. <laughs> uh, no, uh, seriously. Uh, I, um, it's, it's, there's a couple of main reasons. It's to show the general consuming cannabis consuming public, um, <laughs> It's to show people that the bulk of the cannabis that's out in the marketplace is actually crap, and they don't realize it. And and most people may be offended when they hear that. Well, I can tell the difference. I've had that good green. Hold on a second. Have you really stopped and paid attention to each of these various nuances? Um, you know, how was it trimmed? How was it grown? Was it hand trimmed? Was it machine trimmed? Was this grown indoors or outdoors? Was this grown with chemical fertilizers? Was this grown organically in living soil? Each of these factors plays a tremendous role in that end quality. And I believe once people can understand and begin to appreciate the quality, and then we show them the tools and the techniques that these legends and experts are doing, once people can then, after they've evaluated and they've identified and, and, and it secured some of this quality product, that they can consume it in a way to maximize their enjoyment. I think, and it's my hope, that once the public can see the difference, that the demand for what the craft farmer is producing will rise. Because I've been a craft farmer myself for a little over a decade now, and, uh, and I see you know, my fellow craft farmers putting out top-notch product that's not being fully appreciated. Uh, and it, to my in, in my estimation, it's mostly based on uh, on consumers who just uh, don't understand the difference and appreciate it. And so that that's that's the main mission with High Rollers. How can people who don't live in the Emerald Triangle of Mendocino and Humboldt counties, how can they get this appreciation? Because really, they are in a way very much restricted by their local growing and growing condition right so how can they how can they get the access to it that you're talking about um uh, i i genuinely believe that there is quality product available nearly anywhere in the country today it's having the ability to identify assess and verify that quality for example if someone were to go into a uh you know their dispensary in washington dc 
and uh, and then they're given a choice of 20, 30, 40 different flowers to choose from. Um, once they are able to recognize how to assess that quality long before they've ever even consumed it, um, it it's going to increase their odds, let's just put it that way, of ending up with something they're going to be a little more happier with. So, okay, final question. What should they be looking? Do they need to bring a microscope into the dispensary with them? How, how do they do this? What should they be doing? So some of the tools and techniques that, uh, that we go through on high rollers, um, uh, I personally use a jeweler's loop. I have mm-hmm. a 40, uh, 40 times magnification jeweler's loop. has a little built-in LED light uh, that I bring with me nearly everywhere. And certainly if I know I'm going to go and I'd be assessing some new product somewhere. Um, mm-hmm. Swami has been using the same uh, tool, except for he uses a 60 times magnification when he does his assessing through the Emerald Cup judging. Um, so, Are you looking yeah, for having, trichomes? Are you looking for trichomes? Is that what you're looking for? I'm, I'm looking for trichomes. I'm looking to see that those surface trichomes specifically are intact. And now trichomes, you know, it, it's easy to be deceived sometimes. You could look at a nug with your bare eyes and it might be, looks like it's coated in, in, in white. Frosty. And oftentimes you'll say, oh, look how frosty that is. Well, you need the loop. You need that higher magnification to see, are you just seeing stalks? Or are you seeing the trichome stalks with the heads still attached? Because trichomes, you know, there, there are two parts of the trichome. There's the stalk and the head. The mm-hmm. stalks do not contain any cannabinoids whatsoever. All of the flavor, all of the cannabinoids, the terpenes, all the, all the compounds, they're in the head of that uh, terp, uh, uh, of that trichome. It turns for those out, who, who don't know, for those who don't know what that looks like, it looks like a golf ball upon a tee, right? The stalk is the tee, the trichome head is the golf ball, correct? That, that, that's a great analogy. Absolutely. A golf ball on you're a gonna, tee. Um, I, I cut you off. You're about to say something. Sure. When the plants are alive and living, those trichomes are very robust. They, 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 they hold on. You could go up to a live plant and, you know, and, and you don't want to rub it, but you could shake it around. You could grab a branch and like wiggle it around. Those trichomes are intact. Once that flower has been harvested and dried, those trichome heads become very fragile and they break off every time the flower is handled. Mm -hmm. It's as simple as that. So by taking a loop and looking at, at your flower and looking to see how many of the trichome heads, what percentage of those trichome heads are still intact on that flower, it's going to tell you a lot about the care that was put into it all the way through the growth phase, through harvesting, through the drying and curing, through the trimming, through the processing, through the packaging. Mm-hmm. All right, Most flowers, you're going to see a minimum of 50% of those trichome heads have been knocked off. Okay? When you see, yeah. when, when you see a majority of those trichome heads intact, it's just a great sign. Okay. What else could we be looking for? Give me two other things, if possible. Um, look at the at the dryness level of the flower. Um, you want a you want a flower um, that hasn't been overly dried. An overly dried flower will be will have lost a, a majority of the highly volatile terpenes, those flavor mm-hmm. compounds, those aroma mm-hmm. compounds. Um, the, the the yeah. The desiccation, it gets lost through the process. The terpenes mm-hmm. and flavors get lost. Um, so look at the moisture level. You want, you want a flower that's it's, it's spongy. You don't want it one yep. where, you, where you compress it a little bit and it stays compressed. That hasn't been dried enough. It could mm-hmm. potentially mold. Mm-hmm. Okay? You want the one that, that, that you press down on it and it, and it, and it bounces back a little bit. Mm-hmm. And ultimately, when you break it up with your fingers or your grinder, that it has some body to it. That it doesn't turn to dust and it doesn't overly clump up. If it overly oh, no. clumps up, again, it was too moist. If it turns to dust, it was too dry. Yep. What's the third um, qualification we should be looking for? I got sight. Um, I've got touch. I've got the, smell, uh, the aroma. The aroma. Yeah. The aroma should be layered. Is the best way. It's it's beyond intensity of aroma because that's the easy one. Wow, does it smell real strong or does it not smell too strong? That's an easy one, okay? You want something a little more nuanced? Look for the 
aroma layers. Look for something that's not singularly sweet or singularly sour. Look for something that has got some higher notes. It's got some deeper notes in there. That product is going to be... <laughs> It's going to be the more enjoyable and nuanced product when you consume it. You're going to notice those same layers as you're smoking through it. And you're smoking the joint specifically that you're going to get this transition of flavors from the beginning, from that initial green hit to this, to this culmination of all the oils by the time you get down to that final little quarter, a third of the joint. Derek, I can't wait for your cannabis appreciation classes to begin <laughs> whenever they start. You should definitely <laughs> let us know. But listen, well, this they, was they've a already begun, Joe. Yeah. They've, ar- they've, they've already begun, Joe, and it's, and it's, and it's high rollers. <laughs> Tell us when, where people can see it. Uh, high rollers is currently on uh, green-flower.com, and uh, we've been premiering new episodes every Tuesday. There's currently uh, about four episodes that are up, so we've got uh, another four or five to go with uh, with the premiere season, mm-hmm. and uh, you can watch it anytime. It's available 24-7. It's absolutely free. Uh, you need only register at green-flower.com. It, all that takes is an email address, no credit card, no personal information, not even your name. Um, and you'll be on Green Flower that has lots of just great, you know, health-based content in addition to my connoisseurship content. Tons of information. Derek Gilman, thank you so much for your time. It was a pleasure talking to you, and I look forward to more. I had a great time, Joe. I'm looking forward to seeing you soon, too. You know, we're growing and we're growing quickly. And one of the ways we're growing is when people share our podcast with people they think might be interested in it. So we want to encourage you to hit that share button and send an episode to somebody you think will find it of interest. Joe, I think it's important for anyone who's finding out about the show through this episode of the podcast that they understand a little bit more about how the show is structured. This is not... Uh, in the way of like mind of a chef, it's more like the the new David Letterman series, like my next guest. These are sit down conversations, sit down interviews that are uh, it's sort of a mix of wine connoisseurs and people who go to four H clubs and some good old hippies also. I mean, these are not these are not fancy people in bow ties <laughs> being a feat. All right, these are people who've been working with their hands in the dirt growing this plant really from tiny little seedlings to, as Derek said, he grows plants that are 14 feet high. 14 feet by 10 feet around, okay? These are these are mega plants producing mega things. Okay? And, and for an entertainment factor, they get high on the show, yeah? They are rolling some very large... <laughs> Uh, objects, yes, and they are they're smoking it and talking about the flavor profiles and and the terpene content and I, I don't know how Derek can really do the show. Uh, there are sometimes when it looks like he just has to stop. Well, how do, how do how I haven't seen any episodes. Where do I find it? It's Greenflower Media. It's on greenflowermedia.com. Yep, and the show itself is called High Rollers. Cool. I'm gotta check it out. I think you should definitely check it out. We should all check it out. It's really worth seeing. Joe, I have something. I have something interesting here that I'd like to share with you. Uh, this is industrial hemp bud. This is a feminized industrial hemp plant that has been allowed to go to flower, has been harvested and treated just like cannabis flower, and is bred to be this. This particular one uh, is a strain called Gunpowder, and it is ten percent CBD content by by professional lab testing. However, it has less than 0.02% THC in it. This is CBD smokable flour. Have you ever seen anything like this before? I have seen it, but I've never smelled anything with this kind of terpene because it actually smells like cannabis, like a sort of a mild cannabis. The only problem with this is that the name, industrial hemp, is just not something you want to be putting in your body, isn't it? It's such an un- it's such a rotten name for this, isn't it? it? it, it see, I, I can agree with you there. It does sound like you're you're smoking something that should be used to like clean a floor yes. or something. Instead. Yes. Uh, but it really, hemp is a variety of the cannabis plant. Uh, maybe we should drop the industrial side of it. But uh, whole hemp 
CBD is something that has existed in a while. I have never personally seen it in a, a feminized flower form like this. Um, and it's quite interesting. I have taken to mixing it with standard buds and cannabis flower uh, instead of tobacco to roll my spliffs now. Uh, I find it cleaner. I cough less. It's less aggressive to burn it. Uh, and it's more enjoyable. And with the CBD activity, uh, counteracting what has, you know, if you're in New York, you're getting very potent THC. It has actually allowed me to sit and smoke an entire spliff mm. without overdosing myself. That's very old school, isn't it? It really is. You can it, actually get through the whole movie with a, with a, with a spliff. It, huh? that's, that's how it feels. And I, I'm, I'm really positive on this. I'm enjoying it. I've talked with you before about trying to uh, find out if there were ways to use uh, terpene substances like chamomile in uh, as a tobacco replacement to, to offset you know terpene interactions and, and shape and Here's change Here's your solution, highs. my friend. Here it is, man. It Give has, me some of that. Let it, me try it yeah, later. absolutely. Take some with you. Uh, I have two varieties here here's another artisanal variety this is half a percent of thc and eight percent cbd can't wait oh 100 percent legal in all 50 states thank you matthew listeners we thank you for joining us on this episode just like every episode we do have some updates for you out there in the internet landscape the brave new weed podcast has now expanded as and is available on several new different platforms, uh, not to mention now available also on YouTube. So if you're out there, obviously you can subscribe to iTunes and Google Play Music, but also now you can find the Brave New Weed podcast on the Stitcher podcast network and on the iHeartRadio podcast network, as well as you can find us on YouTube.com. So here's where you come in. Uh, listeners, this is what we need from you. For us to be able to claim the YouTube URL of youtube.com slash brave new weed, we have to verify 100 subscribers to the podcast channel on YouTube. And that will allow us to get the custom URL that will allow you to share it with all your friends and family. You can search the brave new weed podcast in the YouTube field and it will direct you directly to our channel where you can subscribe. And once we hit that 100 subscriber threshold, we will immediately fix our URL so that everyone can find us on YouTube. Be sure to tune in for the next episode. It's an interview with Jamie Wheel, who's the co-author of one of the books that changed my life last year. It's called Stealing Fire. It's about this intersection of neurobiology, high performance, certain psychedelics, and, and how they're really coming together in a new way uh, and how so many people are beginning to explore them in different ways. For example, m the idea of microdosing with psychedelics. This is not, by the way, a cannabis-related episode. It's a much broader episode I find very compelling. And the idea in a sentence, if I may be so bold, is to say maybe for the last 40, 50 years we got it wrong. Maybe those mega doses of those substances weren't the way to go. Maybe these tiny doses done in very prescribed yeah. mindful ways led by people who knew what they were doing is a more interesting exploration. So I highly encourage everyone to tune into the next episode. Jamie is a brilliant man. He's, he's come across some information that, uh, I've read the book twice. I've given it to at least 20 people in my life um, because I thought it was so powerful. And I think this interview is, blows, it blew me away. So listen to that next week and thanks again for listening. Thanks for listening to the Brave New Weed Podcast. This episode and all future episodes are made possible by amazing listeners like yourself. If you like what you've heard, we encourage you to show your support by giving $1 a month for special access and rewards on patreon.com slash brave new weed. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram via at brave new weed. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash brave new weed. And remember, you can always find more information about us or information discussed in each episode by pointing your favorite browser to bravenewweed.com.